How's everyone doing? <laughs> Good. All right. I'm also doing well. Um, so welcome. We're gonna we're gonna have this is a gonna be a fun kind of Sunday morning workshop um, because there's sort of four different modes we're gonna be in. Um, first, I'm gonna share some schematics around some uh, the, the concept of ecosystem development and doing organizing from that basis, um, using this concept of from the ground up. Um, then we're gonna kind of do like a, a panel, similar to a lot of the plenaries that we've had. Then y'all are gonna break into small groups and do some work, and then we'll come back. So that's, um, that's different than most things we do in a theater. <laughs> um, I should, um, I should start, I, can I grab like a regular mic and get po outside of the podium since I don't need the computer right now? Hello, all right. Um, so I wanna start by introducing myself and um, should we do everyone right now? Was that? We can do it later. Okay, all right. Um, well, I'll at least in introduce myself and, and Aaron since you're kind of co-facilitating emceeing at this point. Uh, my name is Esteban Kelly, and I actually live in Philadelphia. It's where I do some of the organizing, and it informs the perspective that I'm sharing today. Uh, and I'm the co-executive director for the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops, which is a national uh, membership-based organization. Um, I also am a co-founder and core trainer with uh, an organization called Aorta, which does facilitation and training uh, and education for building up the solidarity economy and helping organizations do their work better. Um, that's all I'll say, maybe, about that. Oh, Aorta is a worker co-op. <laughs> That's a thing. And, uh, and it's actually an acronym. It stands for Anti-Oppression Resource and Training Alliance. Um, I do just want to pause, even though my own brain's a little foggy, and see um, si alguien necesita de ayuda de traducción. Levanta el mano. Si? No? Todo está bien? OK. Um, cool. So we're going to just do this in English. That's easy. Um, Zen? Do you wanna do you wanna come and introduce e some ecosystem stuff with me? Um, so, folks, maybe we can run a mic. I wanted to open with the question of what is, and I'm not saying in a development sense, but just generally, what's an ecosystem? What do you understand to be an, an ecosystem? Yeah. Hang on a second. I think Zen, Zen can get this to you, Hildegard. Hey folks, I'm Zen Chenom. I work at the Democracy Work Institute. Um, I do a lot of uh, ecosystem development uh, by working with local groups around the country to support the growth of worker co-ops. So, so Hildegard, yeah. get us started. What's an ecosystem? Well, simply put, all the different parts of the natural world working together harmoniously. Beautiful. That's beautiful. How's that for Sunday morning, you guys? Come on. Um, anyone else want to add to that or, or other, other understandings of an ecosystem? How does it work? What's an ecosystem? How do we understand it? Yeah. Well, hang on one second. We're going to get you the mic. I mean, an ecosystem, they have a particular character, but all the parts work together. There's a gestalt that happens. There's a something that happens from all the parts working together. Sure. You can have many ecosystems side by side or overlapping with each other, but they have a something yeah. that makes them distinctive, but all the parts work together in terms of creating that. So examples of natural ecosystems that might fit along that, I mean, it could be anything from a desert ecosystem to a rainforest, um, a riparian zone, something in a river area, um, something by a shoreline, waterfront, um, temperate forests, all different kinds of ecosystems. There's probably an ecosystem in your nearest garden or backyard, right? Um, so there's a lot of different elements to it. When we use the, the concept of ecosystem, um, we are taking a similar phenomenon from the natural world and thinking about what are the different actors, institutions, uh, resources, elements that can include, that can include human uh, resources, it can include capital, and how are those um, being tapped into and coming together as you both just beautifully described an ecosystem um, to support the different kinds of initiatives, um, institutions, projects that we're talking about building in order to really start scaffolding a new economy, right? Um, so do you wanna, can you say a little more about ecosystem while I walk us through some elements of it? Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> uh, 
ecosystems are naturally you know diverse and it's and its value comes in from its diversity and I think sometimes um, in the cooperative space we sometimes forget that there are uh, other partners that we can be building relationships with um, to really do transformative work and sometimes we gets we get really used to working with uh, the with you know the, just the cooperative community that you're aware of but there are other movements out there that one can be building strong partnerships and alliances with to advance a common agenda for for economic and social justice, um, and could be partnering with each other to do all forms of work to support a more robust ecosystem uh, for, for that work to be done. Um, and that could take the shape and form of, of policy, advancing policy together, uh, identifying uh, e educational strategies, maybe partnering with an academic institution to, to provide uh, business uh, planning education, um, uh, to, to, to entrepreneurs that are looking to, to start worker cooperatives. I mean, there's certain ways that you could start finding um, and identifying common cause amongst people in the ecosystem to really just get to the root cause of, 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 uh, of the problem that you all want to address and figuring out what solutions make the most sense. And I think what's so fascinating and exciting about ecosystem development is that it's going to look really different in every single place you're working in, um, but the, the principles still remain where it's like ha coming together as a community, figuring out what the common cause is, identifying where there's reciprocity, um, and, sh and figuring out like what, the, what would it look like to, 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 go, to go really deep and long in terms of your vision and backwards planning from that. And you'll start finding that y y what you thought was your ecosystem right here is actually much larger and there's potentially a lot more partners that could be part of that mix. We're just gonna spend like two more minutes. Um, explaining this framework, and then we're gonna dive into this example, looking at what, what the work that they're doing on the ground in Boston. Um, so the idea is not, just like natural ecosystems, um, not if certain elements are present, but, but what's there and how do you use them? How strong are they? What, what, what uh, dominance do they have in what you're doing? Um, and it's funny, this color coding, I think this was meant to, originally we were gonna have butcher paper <laughs> all around the room, and then they put us in this room. So uh, the color coding corresponds to the, the, <laughs> the, the sheets that you're gonna see in a minute. Um, so it's looking at what is your kind of concoction of the different elements that you have there? What's strongest, what's dominant? How do you use them in order to, um, to iterate and feed each other and build up scale? All right, so. Let's go to essential. Okay, so some of the things that are essential for your ecosystem. Who's there? What's your on the ground talent and skills? You don't need to be able to read this. I'm, I'm gonna interpret it for you. <laughs> uh, it's also not my handwriting, it's from a workshop like a year ago. Um, skills and talent. The skills of um, organizers, uh, community leaders, people who are elected, whatever those are. This is, this is about like who's there Who's gonna hustle? Who's gonna do that work? Whether they're formal capital O organizers, whether they're informal organizers, block captains, right? How is this different in an urban and rural context, et cetera, et cetera, all right? Um, management, leadership, member skills is what it says there. Financing, okay, that also looks different. Different regions, um, it's gonna be, be different if you're from Canada than if you're in the US, right? Um, what is the context ecosystem you have for grants, different kinds of investments or loans? Um, community capital. What's the potential there for grassroots funds that aren't being tapped into, right? Think about it again. I should have said this in the beginning. I have a background in ecology. That's what my undergraduate was in, kind of like political economy and ecology. It's a funny thing. Um, but thinking about what, what, is, what are the, those potential resources you could tap into. So if something, if you're dealing with nutrient deficient soil, if, there, if it lacks nitrogen, for example, um, then it's probably maxed out all the nitrogen. It might have maxed out all the, 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 the small foundations in the area. Um, so what, what, if that's gonna be your limiting factor, how do you unlock that, mm. right, to feed your ecosystem and help it grow? Okay, um, this, the last one is, uh, is really looking at, for example, an institution of growing cooperatives. So growth-oriented cooperative developers, um, looking at who's there who's already doing similar work how do you link up with them in coalition, support what they're doing, rather than be like, I have this idea, get behind me. Um, linking into networks and associations and professional groups. We've been talking about networks a lot this weekend, um, so I don't need to elaborate on that. So these are things that you must have 
um, in doing your organizing. Then there's some other stuff. Um, mm -hmm. These are things that are important to have. They're not necessarily uh, essential, necessary, but they help. Um, business supports, this is the Beyond Business as Usual track, of course. Um, let me see if I can decipher the handwriting. So business advisors and industry networks, public economic development um, programs, uh, workforce development. So those are different things that, that you might be tapping into on the business side. Um, connection to market. Uh, the potential of the different projects you're going to be doing is going to depend on, right, if you're dealing with gentrification, you're dealing with stabilizing housing, well, what's the market context um, of housing rates, right? Um, key, key industries that are involved, supply chains, um, key customers and anchors, so who's going to be buying these, who needs this thing? Hopefully you started with the question of what does that community need, and then that's where the idea for your project or initiative is coming from, right? Um, and not to overlook the potential for government contracting. When we're really starting to look at building to scale, um, it's getting beyond the um, yard sale <laughs> idea and getting into the can a university purchase or procure this thing that we're doing, right? So who are your clients? Um, policies, of course, really uh, helpful and important. Tax incentives, let's shift those from going to the corporations to going uh, to the projects that we're involved in, right, that are really serving the community. Government funding um, and uh, laws and regulations that are favorable for the work that you're doing, of course. Um, and then lastly, advocacy partnerships. Who else is there? Um, getting your community out, that could be canvassing kind of things. Um, and I'm not gonna unpack the last slide, but I'll just show it to you, um, which is the sort of overall environmental. And here, we mean that in the broad, legal sense of environment, not in the ecological <laughs> sense. Um, so yeah, we've got values driven, business community, attitudes and culture, um, and different kinds of community solidarity, cooperative education. So hopefully that's, um, that's some helpful context for you. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Aaron Tanaka. Thank you, Esteban. <coughs> really um, appreciate sort of the, the top level and as someone who does this work uh, nationally, um, and is also supporting local groups. Uh, it's, it's really cool to hear sort of your own take on how we think about ecosystems, and it's, it's very similar to how, how we are also. So um, again, very happy to be here. My name is Aaron uh, from Boston uh, with the Center for Economic Democracy and with the Boston Impact Initiative. And we're here to talk about the Ujima Project. Um, this is our own local ecosystem building intervention, and we are just so excited to be here with y'all and I just want to say that I'm incredibly excited to have this group of um, this incredible women on the stage. Uh, this is like a powerhouse crew. So from if you're from Boston, you know you've heard of all these folks, and um, you know I'm just I'm hopefully you'll be able to just appreciate some of the incredibleness that they bring forward into our project. Um, we are very grateful to be here all together and to be learning from from everyone. It's been a really um, Really amazing weekend for most of us, and I think that all the learnings we've taken, we're gonna bring back right into our ecosystem. So uh, thank you all for being here. Okay, so I'm just gonna do a little, huh? Ooh. How do you get the, do you know how to help? Help? <laughs> yes. What? Anybody? Hello? Wait, seriously, I need help on the. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's gonna come over here. Oh, amazing. Okay. All right. Don't mean to be, uh, it's still not, still not, hold on. Okay. Sorry, y'all. We had it up earlier, but it's not going now. Okay. Um, can anybody come up and fiddle with this while I start keep talking, please? All right. All right, cool. So I'm going to just take uh, a second to introduce the project, uh, do a very quick overview of the ecosystem, and then we're going to actually hear from the folks um, about what they're doing and how they relate. Okay, so the quick background is that there are a few organizations, Center for Economic Democracy, uh, which I work with, and we're really interested in, in building alternatives to capitalism. That's kind of our explicit purpose, and really working in grassroots communities, communities of color, uh, to help build those solutions on our own. Um, City Life is a housing justice organization, a nationally recognized group that is one of our largest b uh, base building organizations in the city of Boston, well known for doing eviction blockades, for example. Um, 
And then Boston Impact Initiative is an impact investment fund that I also got to work with and Deborah's representing and does uh, impact investing in the city of Boston, right? And so we came together two years ago actually to ask the question, what would it really take for us to scale community land trust, which is a strategy that City Life has been building, uh, as well as worker-owned cooperatives, which is work that I had been involved in helping facilitate development in Boston, and then Boston Impact Initiative was very excited about financing as an investor, right? And so we started asking the question of what would it take to really build scale and allow communities to, to build the future that we want to we wanna live in. And so we started doing a community finance study group, and we had people from all over our networks uh, rep no, wrong slide, thank you. <laughs> this was yesterday's workshop, thank you. <laughs> oh, you know, but the transition strategy is very relevant, it turns out. Um, <clears throat> okay, here we go, here we go. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Esteban, I appreciate it. Okay, so, whoa, does that work? All right, too much, this is why we don't need technology. Okay, so, uh, we started looking at community controlled uh, models of economic development, and this is basically what this conversation is about today. What does it mean for communities to democratize the decisions, right, that impact our own economic development? So much of the, so much of the investment that comes into our neighborhoods, you know, lands on us, right? And so our question is how do we build our own capacity to control our work? The second sort of key piece is that we, f we started to feel like there was a gap between the grassroots base building political work, right, that some of us represent on this panel, and then the business and finance world, right? So we know that we need to start articulating a vision for the future that are, is gonna compel us and move us beyond uh, the necessary critique of the dominant system, right? And we know that there's some models that are actually getting built of cooperatives, again, in land trust. But what we found is that so many of these models were actually mostly being built by privileged middle-class white folks. And so we knew that there is value of bringing these into our communities. In fact, our communities in so many ways have developed these models in the first place. And Jessica's point, Jessica gordon Namehart's point that the new economy, in fact, is not new, and this is drawing on ancient traditions, right, that were based out of survival. So we understand all of this, right? Um, but we saw this divide in the nonprofit sort of industrial complex, and the question is, how do we get our folks together? Well, we, we, we said, let's get our folks together and figure it out. And so that was sort of the basis behind the community finance study group, allowed us to start meeting Learning, um, learning from each other to really understand what our issues <clears throat> are and what we could bring to the table together. <clears throat> uh, two more quick points. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the other major piece basically is, I guess I'll just say, is about the ecosystem. And this is where I'm gonna just quickly go over some slides and I'm gonna get it over to y'all. So I think Esteban, your point about the ecosystem is about relationships and stakeholders. This was also part of our premise and so, um, what we started to do is bring together this sort of top level group of stakeholders, right? The individuals and families, uh, and this is who we're sort of really trying to organize, individuals and families, workers, locally owned businesses, community organizations, donors and funders, and social investors, right? And to get us all into a space together to start envisioning. And I think a really important piece, um, my friend Farhad often talks about this idea about an ecosystem, right? It's not about the individual pieces, it's about how they're relating to each other. And that's a lot of what we want to emphasize today is that a lot of the models that we're gonna be offering and building are things that are happening successfully all around the country and the world. What we think is kind of unique about our work is how we're linking them together to become a mutually reinforcing ecosystem. So just very quickly, we have a sort of value chain loop and we talk about building a community capital fund uh, that is democratized and allows for um, everyday people, all of us to put our money in, invest together. We're interested in building a good business network that articulates the standards for the kinds of businesses that we want to support, and then so we could actually support them through, for example, market organizing. We want to organize our own consumption, right? If we all collectively invest in businesses together, um, how do we also make sure that we go shop at them, right? We have economic power as consumers as well, but it's not necessarily organized, and we're interested in using a local currency for that purpose. And then we also want to flex our political power, right, as a coalition of businesses and grassroots base building organizations, labor unions. How can we use political influence to help build support for our ecosystem? And so that's sort of the 30-second the, <laughs> the version of a very complex project that we're trying to build. We're not gonna go into this, but there's an interest in building a capital fund that Deborah and Hendricks are gonna talk a little bit more about. Um, and we're gonna apply participatory budgeting, as I said. Good business certification. I, I'm not gonna spend any time on these. We wanna, but these are the kinds of things that we're concerned about, health, environment, labor, local, right? 
And we want to support these businesses in different ways, um, which again, we'll talk about in the small groups. Don't worry. And then finally, there's ways for us to move political power again to get these institutions to support us. And we're going to talk about that as well. The last thing I'm going to say before I hand it over is, you know, this is a big project. We've actually been now planning this piece of it, the Ujima project, which I should mention. Um, you know, Ujima Theater here is here in, in Buffalo. Uh, and Ujima, for those who don't know, is a Kwanzaa principle, stands for collective work and responsibility. We, we sort of see that as a value of solidarity. Um, this pro project is very complex, so we want to do some short experiments for people to start seeing what it's like. So we're actually working on doing a very low-key investment day where people are going to come with small amounts of money. We have some businesses that are pre-vetted that are going to present to the community, and people are actually going to vote on who they want to invest in. It's going to be a zero-interest loan, and we're going to use Kiva Zip as a platform for this purpose. Um, so I hope you're um, at least perked up a little bit about what we're trying to do, and now it's my pleasure to sort of pass this down the line um, and have you all sort of describe what your work is and why you're, why you're relating to the GEMA project. Hi, good morning, everybody. It is Sunday morning, really early. So my name is Lisa Owens. I'm the executive director of a housing justice group uh, in Boston called City Life Vida Urbana. We are, thank you. Uh, we are a 43-year-old housing justice organization. Um, we're a base-building grassroots group that works um, uh, both locally in Boston, in the greater Boston region, and, th and through really incredible partnerships with, um, with both fledgling, you know, um, uh, informal groups and all the way up to very, very established groups, you know, are able to, to work um, regionally and nationally to, uh, to advance housing justice in our country. Um, our, our, I, I guess I want, so my job in two minutes is to say why City Life is, is such a, um, an ardent supporter of the Ujima project. Um, I think it's important to say that it's, Ujima is interesting to a lot of different people because there are lots of different moving parts and each part is really exciting and you can kind of geek out on like the techie part or on the, you know, the, the good business certification and, um, and, and lose sight of the whole. So, so, we're, so we're a base building, a grassroots um, uh, movement building organization that, uh, and our mission is to, is, is to work you know, with, with everybody else in this country that's working for justice to, uh, to, to take advantage of the, of the huge fissure that, is, that, that, that global capitalism is experiencing right now and to, and to completely change the system. Right, um, and, and so we work for for justice, for real justice and real transformation. Uh, we are an anti-capitalist organization. We are um, we're working for for racial justice and um, and and justice and equity in every domain. So it's important to say that because Ujima is not, from our standpoint, a market intervention. It's not an opportunity to kind of get some more government contracts or to get some businesses to change you know, some piece of their practice. This is an experiment for, for those of us who are, who are doing um, organizing on the ground, who are working for true community control of land and wealth and housing, and who have already built up a lot of solidarity muscle. Who, you know, we're, we're, we have um, lots of experiences of, of, of making decisions together, of analyzing our social structure together, of planning and, you know, failing and, and, and living and loving cooperatively together. We have a lot of muscle that's built up, and a lot of it is, um, is, um, is in resistance. And our membership has been really looking for opportunities to experiment around building something new. And so this is, a, this is an opportunity for our, for our grassroots, our base building, our members, our leaders, to, to experiment, um, to, 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 to try to carve out a temporary space to build, to, to, to experience what would, what would um, economic solidarity look like post-capitalism. And so the Ujima model is, is loosely modeled after the socialist triangle 
um, at least this is how we see it, um, that, Mark, um, that Michael Leibowitz talks about in The Socialist Alternative. You know, so, so there are elements of, of community ownership of wealth. There are elements of, community, of, of, of collective standard making and decision making and allocation. There are elements of, of, of um, radical redistribution of wealth in the Ujima project. And so we're, we're part of this because this is our opportunity to, to experiment with what would it feel like in the new system. So that's why we're part of this. Awesome. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Thanks, Nia. Good morning. Um, my name is, I don't have a very loud voice, so can everyone hear me? Okay, great. So my name is Nia Evans, and I am the executive director of the Boston branch of the NAACP. Uh, the NAACP stands for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Uh, just really quickly for some people who may not be familiar with the organization, it is the oldest civil rights organization in the nation. I think we're at 106, 105, 106 years old right now. Uh, the Boston branch is the oldest chartered branch in the nation. Um, and it's interesting that I'm following Lisa because we are a, we're a slightly different organization than City Life. Um, we are definitely moderate. Uh, <laughs> um, our, our membership is diverse. Um, our, our membership is uh, economically diverse. Um, our membership, of course, is, is, is racially diverse, but the, I guess the diversity I want to key in on is, is the uh, economic diversity, um, which, which then means we have uh, the task of trying to represent a lot of different um, belief systems, a lot of different values, uh, a, lot, a lot of different ideologies within, uh, within one, one membership. Um, we are a multi-issue organization. Uh, we are an all-volunteer organization. Um, my position is actually the only position that's a paid position, at least in, in Boston, um, which then also means that the work that we do kind of just depends on the, the goodwill and the, and the free time that our members have um, after they do their uh, day jobs. And which, which then also means we're run by committee. And we're, we deal with about 23 different issues, all with a racial justice, racial equity lens. So why does this project uh, interest us? Um, last year, I was the chair of our Economic Development and Labor and Industry Committee. And last year, uh, Boston was a candidate city for the 2024 Olympics. Um, and so that was a huge uh, conversation um, in every quarter of Boston. And, you know, so I mentioned the economic diversity of our organization. Um, there, were, there were some of us who saw opportunity, who saw positive opportunity uh, for the Olympics coming to Boston. Some of us who had looked at uh, how, how Olymp the Olympics has taken place in other cities in the past and worried about some of the negative impacts. Um, and, and then some of us who were just kind of you know, prepare as much as, as much as we could, as much as we could with negative and positive impacts should the Olympics come to the city. Um, we we uh, actually made the decision not to take a stance because what we realized was, and Aaron referred to this earlier, um, with these projects, development projects, and the Olympics just happens to be a huge one, um, with new ideas, uh, with different plans that come to the city, oftentimes communities of color, low-income communities, uh, we find ourselves not a part of the process until a, until a much later point, at which point, you know, we're usually kind of brought in to, to, to kind of to give the sign-off, maybe give a little bit of feedback, um, and, you know, uh, it, it could be said that our, we, we provided our input we're going ahead and we're okay with, with everything that's happened. Um, and so we said, this isn't sustainable. We can't keep doing this from project to project. So we can't, every time a development project happens, we can't then try to figure out, do we support it, do we not? Um, if we don't support it, how do we resist? What do we, what do, we do? So what's more important is the underlying uh, conversation, which is, what is the process in the first place? So what is the process by which development and planning happens in our city in the first place? Um, and how are we, and, we, and, and one thing we already know is we are left out of the process. Whatever it is, we're left out. We're not there when we should be there. By the time we come in, it's too late. So we wanted to have a conversation about the process and about reforming the process. Um, and uh, so we worked with a 
bunch of different organizations. Um, we worked with uh, black business people in Boston, uh, different groups like Right to the City and City Life, it's a, that's a coalition, City Life is a part of that coalition. Uh, black Economic Justice Institute, there's someone here, she just peeked out from her, <laughs> her iPad. <laughs> um, so, so we worked on bringing a bunch of different people together so that we could get perspectives from each sector and try to uh, create a template. Um, fast, fast forwarding, thank you. Um, so dur during the process of this conversation, one of the things that was very important was the decision making process, like I said, uh, community control. Um, and, and for us, the Ujima project is a response to what we were hearing from community members. Uh, so community, what we were hearing from community members were, was, was frustration, like I said, with the process. What's our level of control? We would hear things like, okay, we, we, have, a gentr we have gentrification in Boston. Um, let's get together, let's pool resources, let's try to get together, buy some property, let's try to get together, form businesses. And so for us, the Ujima Project is a concrete manifestation of, con of conversations that we were hearing. So this is a way for us, when, with our membership, and with community members, when we hear these little bits of conversations, to, to be able to say, this can actually happen. This is not wishful thinking, this is not abstract. Um, this is an effort that you, can, that you can plug in now, and it's one of our major initiatives. Which we're very Thank excited you. about. Thank you, Nia. Right. Awesome. Okay, so Maya. Oh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, waking up with us. Good morning. Hi. <laughs> cool. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and also about the Seto Cooperative. Uh, my name is Maya Gall, born and raised in Boston. Um, grew up there and have the fortunate opportunity of participating as a worker owner in the SETO Cooperative. SETO stands for Cooperative Energy Recycling and Organics, or Cooperativa para Re, uh, Energía, Reciclaje y Organicos. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's really awesome. Uh, we're a bilingual cooperative. Um, and we came out of um, my elders in the community deciding that there needs to be an alliance between um, Latino and black workers to create good green jobs in our communities. Um, also understanding that there's a huge issue with food waste and that food waste is um, producing methane at a, an alarming rate um, and polluting our cities. So, and, and basically our world. So when we think about um, a cooperative that does um, commercial composting, Really, it came about through an alliance between MASHCOS, which is the Massachusetts um, Occupational Safety and Hazard uh, Latina workers who are doing um, green economy work and, and realized that um, they needed to band together um, with the black workers from the Boston Workers Alliance who were doing oil, uh, use oil collection. And so through sort of a, an analysis of all the different waste streams, um, of recyclable waste streams, and understanding that organics is um, very sustainable and um, a non-volatile uh, commodity that we could really uh, build a base for our cooperative off of. Um, so in coming together um, to do that, we realize that um, there is no real um, difference between climate justice, social justice, economic justice. Um, so when we do our work, we realize that you know, providing jobs in our communities is an integral part in thinking about how we can participate. And that's why we decide to participate in the Ijuma Project. Um, because one of the seven cooperative principles is to support other cooperatives. Um, and through that, we're looking to understand not only how to do that, but continue providing green jobs in Boston uh, for people who are either low income or don't have access um, or are in underserved areas. Yeah, so I think uh, I'm very excited to share with you all more. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, Maya. You. 
Good morning, I'm Deborah Fries with the Boston Impact Initiative and one of the um, pleasures of this project is I'm just even this looking at this panel where we have people who are both living in the community and representing community membership. We have co-ops and business and we have finance and capital and you know I realize I see these folks, we run into each other c continuously in the city, this project and beyond. So some of the things that I think Ujima is like a, a fractal or microcosm of what's beginning to happen as we weave the different sectors of the city together, which is essential, right? And this whole ecosystem approach um, is at the heart of my work. I've been a student of living systems thinking for the past decade. And a lot of my work before starting the, the Boston Impact Initiative was in the Global South, where we were looking at a lot of anti-development work and how do we create the conditions for healthy and resilient communities to emerge from within, especially in places where they have been most destroyed by international development. And that led me um, to do some work around, uh, so I wrote a book called Walk Out, Walk On about walking out of failing dominant systems and walking on to build the new. And that looks idea that- like you have a that, fan in the audience, Deborah. Sorry? It uh, looks like you have a fan in the audience. Thank you, thank you. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> awesome, awesome, thank you. So it's, it, it's through intimacy with place that we create the conditions for healthy and resilient communities to emerge. And as I was beginning to understand that and spending 80% of my time not in my own place, people were calling me to task on that and saying, wait a minute, you say all change is local, it's through intimacy with place, and it's ecosystem-based. There is no ecosystem that is not place-based. Everything happens in the place, on the land, and the people who are on that land, and the resources of that land, right? And so I came home and started the Boston Impact Initiative as a place-based impact investing fund with a focus on racial and economic justice. And the reason for that focus is, again, from this living systems perspective, if you think about any living system, say the human body, right? And you look at a healthy human body circulates resources to all parts of it. What an unhealthy human body does is it accumulates resources in one area for unregulated growth, right? That's called cancer. That's our economic system. We accumulate resources in a parts of the body and unregulated growth occurs in those areas at the cost of the rest of the human body. So it seems that a healthy system is one which distributes resources to all parts, that's what the human body does, especially where they're most needed. So for me, that led to the notion of creating, how do we build an investment using finance and capital, which in our human economy is like the circulation of blood, like oxygen, like nutrients moving through. Money is a prox, it's one of the nutrients that moves through our, our ecosystem, our living system. How do we correct that action so it's not accumulating continuously in the wrong places? Ujima, to me, is one of the answers to that. We have to use private capital and institutional capital and redirect it to the places where it's most needed, not determined by the places where it's held. It has to be determined by the community itself. And so how do, through the Boston Impact Initiative, how can we not only contribute private capital, but access other sources of private capital and do our work with other people who are controlling that capital to, in partnership and in community and in relationship, come into the process. And when, when Hendrix and I talk later about the cap community capital part, we'll talk about all the ways that there are different roles for different capital to play so that community, people who have not had a chance to direct it, have the essential role in directing the flow of that capital while other capital supports and is in reciprocity and mutuality with it. So it's, a, it's an inquiry, it's an experiment, um, and it's, I think, probably the most essential experiment I think we can be in around capital and community today. Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> okay, and finally, so, Hendrix. Thank you. So my name is Hendrix Berry, um, and thank you guys for saying so much. Um, so I'm gonna be pretty short. 
I work part-time for an uh, independent small investment advisor in Boston, and we focus on sustainable and socially responsible investing. Uh, my work is to help build out a local investing component of that to complement the, the work that we do with public markets. I also work part-time for a community development corporation in Jamaica Plain, where I live, helping, supporting small businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, so, my, I think for me, the Ujima project is, like many have said, it's an experiment. Um, and it's a really beautiful experiment uh, that inspires me in my day jobs. Um, and it's really, for me, about playing a small experimental role around reparations in our city. Um, so that's, that's kind of the framework that I come to this with. The Ujima Project is about shifting power and returning wealth to communities from which it's been extracted and um, really confronting, or ex being experimental in confronting the way that traditional finance works and the effect that it has in local economies and uh, trying to think about how can, how can we locally take control of finance and what decide what gets invested in, what does not, and begin to redistribute, return that, that wealth uh, to a more equitable and just space. Um, so as, yeah, I guess just as somebody who works in finance, as somebody who's trying to change finance, as a white person living in Boston, building building this model, building this infrastructure that um, that we can learn from and play with is really important. And so it kind of, for me, uh, the, the, at the center is this community controlled loan fund, but then there's a lot of possibility and opportunity to build around that. Well, the community controlled loan fund and the, and the community standards, um, but building off of that is really, um, really exciting for me. And I hope you guys uh, catch that bug. Awesome. Thank you, Hendrix. All okay. right. So you, you can see why I was really excited about being here with this amazing group of people. We are now going to split up because our, our ecosystem, again, has multiple components to it, right? There's investment capital, organizing businesses, organizing consumers, and, and advocacy. And so we wanted to break up into three groups, and we are going to rotate, and y'all can stay sitting. But we do need people to help quickly move a little bit, right? So the, what, what we want to do is get people spread, spread out into three groups, and my feeling is... We should have like a group in that back, right? We should have a group right up here in the front, and we should have a group over there in the back. So if folks are willing to just quickly self-organize ourselves uh, into those spaces, um, yes? We are going to, no, just, just get into three equal-ish groups, and, and we'll do the rest, all right? And so folks in the front, you can stay in the front, you know, come move, all right. So why don't we actually start spreading out? So I knew what Katrina did here was a result of a natural disaster. What I saw out there was a man-made disaster. Katrina gave uh, the government ammunition to tear down something that they had been planning for years and years to get rid of, which is public housing. In the aftermath of the, of the Katrina catastrophe, I think that you know a city looks at itself almost like an individual in a time of trauma. You, know, you say, am I leading the life I'm supposed to lead? Right now, we've got 52% unemployment as it relates to African-American males, right? But we're experiencing an economic boom. The mayor and too many of our business people wanted the market things to recover, and that's what we got. Uh, we should have fought for a, uh, a, a, a community-based recovery. People when they think of New Orleans, they would just think that like, 
Like we are a beacon, like just everything is just great here. Um, but it's not. What we have to look at is the refusal to acknowledge race and the absolutely race silent or race averse um, approach to a lot of the way that the city and the um, federal government approach this. They see the Mardi Gras, you know, they look at the French quarters, all these things are truly happening. It has come back, for, but for the local people, the local people are not back. The local people are being pushed out of work, pushed out of housing, pushed into poverty. I'm Laura Flanders. This week we're in New Orleans, a city known for its music, its cuisine, its culture, and Hurricane Katrina. Ten years ago, 80% of this city was underwater. Since then, $71 billion in federal money has been spent. But has every opportunity been seized to bring back not just the place, but its people, so they're stronger and healthier than before? That's our question this week on The Laura Flanders Show. Well, we're standing here in the night ward, and what, 85% uh, of it is still vacant? Lieutenant General Russell Honoré, a Louisiana native, had just returned from Iraq when Katrina made landfall, and he was put in charge of the military rescue and relief efforts. The problem was people in the city needed